this year actually marked uh, uh, 50 years of uh, Kiss Dr. Kissinger's secret visit to China. We just had a webinar with him just about uh, 20 days ago that uh, celebrated uh, his historical visit. And also, it's a 20 years of China joined WTO and uh, uh, you know, 30 years of uh, ending the Cold War. Uh, that's where uh, Susan started uh, uh, your diplomatic uh, State Department, diplomatic career. Uh, uh, very, very uh, glorious. What, what, what I would like to say, actually, maybe put a little detail, because uh, we had the uh, uh, Deputy Secretary of State, uh, uh, Ms. Sherman's visit to Tianjin. And then in that meeting, I think it's better than Alaska, probably both sides and now come up with some uh, concrete list now, you know, at least to say we, we have to, you know, work down and see how we can resolve those differences. And of course, also that uh, uh, Chinese has proposed that there's some uh, uh, ideas how we can really shut down, you know, maybe some east of, of the controversy or, or things that the China don't want. But uh, on the other hand, also, uh, the, uh, the U.S. has proposed at least two. Uh, so, but ultimately, we hope that maybe, uh, as Susan, you said, you know, maybe this COVID-19 is not really helping. We need more uh, frequency of the higher senior diplomatic visit, but also uh, probably even top heads of the state visit, uh, a meeting at G20 if possible. But right after the meeting of Tianjin, uh, Foreign Minister Qing Gang arrived in Washington. Uh, I, uh, so we hope that we can start a new uh, some concrete uh, discussion on that. Yesterday, uh, Steve Orleans, uh, the, the from National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, he wrote a piece at the South China Morning Post in the, he, titled, How the U.S. Can Craft a Bold and Positive China Agenda That Benefits All Americans. Basically, he's uh, up at, he said, uh, let's, let's revoke uh, tariffs, let's revisit the curbs on the Chinese people, Chinese companies, and the media, engage constructively on human rights and international norms, fine-tune Taiwan policy, and ditch confrontation. The U.S. should not understate the benefit of constructive engagement brought to the American people. So it seems a very good op-ed, and he made a lot of recommendations, you, you know, relax the visas, relax student visit, you know, and then maybe we, we, we should not confrontation so much. So, you know, you could give some more insights on that. <laughs> Susan, please. I wasn't so happy that the, uh, frankly, that the, the notion of giving the U.S. a list of demands was publicized because I think then, you know, politically harder in the U.S. to do those things, not easier. It's good to keep, in U.S.-China relations, it's good to keep some of those detailed issues um, for the closed door meeting. But so I hope that won't, um, you know, just sit, it won't entrench the two sides demanding that the other side make the first move. I'm afraid that might be where we are now. And I, I, I do worry about that. We need somebody to do something that's a little bit, um, you know, bold and shows leadership to try to get this thing on unstuck. But I'm hopeful that these kind of, you know, lists of issues and certainly Wendy Sherman's uh, meeting there, both sides mentioned these areas for potential cooperation. Um, climate change has, of course, been one that it's going to be very hard, but I'm going to keep pushing it because it's inexcusable and will be a uh, historical shame if we don't do it. Um, and, you know, there are other issues, Afghanistan, North Korea, I think uh, were mentioned. So there are a number of areas where we can... Um, you know, find ways, hopefully, to cooperate. We're doing, uh, you know, joint negotiations still, I hope, with Iran, and I hope that that it becomes more fruitful in the future than, it, than it's indicating right now. But we, we, you know, we have to do these things together, and I hope we can sort of work toward something pragmatic like that after these meetings. Um, but, the, you know, the, there's still this, there's a lot of politics swirling around in Washington, you know, pointed out. And frankly, there's a lot of things happening also in Beijing. And, you know, the domestic politics are really creating a lot of problems for both sides right now. And I think we do need to see some bold leadership in both capitals to try to get through this impasse. Uh, maybe a little bit less worrying about, you know, protecting your flank from this or that. I don't know how realistic that is. Maybe Ronnie has a, a view on that for how realistic it is in Beijing. Um, you know, it is difficult in Washington right now, big spending bills through, and it's, it's a difficult political environment for him. But 
You know, I do think he wants to get the relationship with China in a better place. So I, you know, just knowing him and knowing his experience with China, even though he sounds tough and he is tough, I think in the region, China's military buildup is causing concern and that causes demand signals for U.S. US's feeling after Trump over exaggerated need to reassure people in the region that the U.S. is going to be there and, you know, in the face of their insecurity coming from China's military buildup. But the real problem is um, the economy. The Americans and Joe Biden, the, you know, it's really not clear the shape, the future shape of the international economy and the place of the U.S. China in it is very, is very cloudy right now, I think. And um, international businesses are feeling this. Um, I think developed countries and growth are feeling this. And it's causing a lot of anxiety. And I think that the, the really the sort of feeling that there's an economic threat coming from China. We can't make China understand why we feel this way is, is a real problem. We are the US China relationship certainly going through an agonizing <laughs> process. But we hope that uh, it will be really, uh, you know, getting better maybe in a, in a longer run. Because I, I recently, we had a, a CCG has conducted a number of uh, uh, dialogues. We, we talked to, uh, you know, uh, the Graham Allison, uh, Joseph Nye, uh, Martin Wolf, uh, Tom Friedman, you know, all of them. Uh, uh, and also one day ago, we talked with John Fountain and, and quite a few others. Uh, well, I think we don't disagree uh, the, the, that we, we shouldn't have a great cold war. I mean, US and China, uh, there was adjustment period. I mean, Joseph and I, you said maybe by 2035, we, when we look back, we, we probably, uh, you know, can, can maybe uh, repair the relation and then maybe get back to uh, some kind of normalcy. We need a little bit longer uh, horizon to look at that. Uh, so, uh, so Susan, I know that you worked in the in the Council of Journal in Chengdu. It's unfortunate we shut that down. I mean, and then uh, U.S. shut down the Houston. Yeah, yeah. So maybe you could give some further advice on that. I've heard quite a few people say that it's going to take quite a long time for U.S.-China relations to shake out. This time, um, that we're going to go through a cycle of maybe, you know, ten years of a downturn. But I really think that we cannot afford. Uh, to have that happen because what's going to happen if uh, we have this divorce that Ronnie's talking about or even a divorce uh, without the formality of divorce but just basically a bifurcation or a separation I mean it's gonna it's gonna impact the international system and we've got globalization now so we need an international system and it's uh, so I'm I'm not really convinced that we're going to be able to get along um, in, in the sort of globalized. I mean, we've passed peak globalization. I agree with Ronnie about that. But there are certain elements of globalization that are not going to turn back. And those still need to be uh, governed by some kind of international discourse and system that goes beyond just the UN Charter. And I think these are extremely difficult for governments to work on together, particularly the U.S. and Chinese governments. They've always been difficult, but they're impossible right now. I mean, are we just going to let these transnational criminals run rampant because the U.S. and China can't talk to each other? Um, we need to have some kind of institutions that, you know, can generate consensus among countries and where we can sort of try to fit our systems together. And the thing I have to say about you know, interference in internal affairs is prohibited by the UN Charter. I mean, this, you know, is a real problem in our relationship. And I think we have to have an honest conversation about it. I mean, all countries interfere in other countries' internal affairs. We have embassies in those, you know, countries, and they're always doing this kind of stuff, you know, monitoring what's going on there, lobbying the governments. I mean, that, you know, we're trying to influence each other constantly. And in a globalized world, you know, this is just going to be a fact of life. And so we've got to figure out what is the real problem here? What are the rules by which we can sort of regulate this? And how can we fit our systems together more seamlessly on both the economic front, first and second largest economies in the world, and we're not going to have trade? I don't believe it. So, um, you know, that's going to have to be worked out but also all these other areas where we have overlapping and transnational boundary issues, migration, crime, um, cyber, space, all of these other areas, pandemics, health, 
um, transportation, uh, which, you know, mobility, uh, people movement back and forth. This isn't going to stop just because the U.S. and China aren't getting along. I mean, even during the Soviet Union, when we had a very major estrangement between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, we still had people flows and some trade back and forth. So, um, you know, and I, I want to just repeat again that China is not the Soviet Union and it should not try to be the Soviet Union. That would be a huge mistake for both China, but also for the for the world, I think. Actually, you know, it's fascinating discussion, you know, uh, both Susan and Ronnie. And, and uh, what, what I think, you know, both of you are really pointed out something very significant that, of course, post Second World War, the U.S. led the global government system actually, you know, pushed the world into prosperity, and you know, we have avoided the major catastrophe of Third World War. But uh, but but absolutely, the, the system uh, probably needs upgrade, needs uh, enrichment, needs enhancement. Uh, where I think China can probably uh, you know help uh, on that as well. Uh, I, I just read uh, some uh, something that uh, Susan just uh, probably mentioned before and written that. Uh, and you wrote that uh, the, uh, the only realistic path forward for the United States and China is to e co-evolve uh, through co cooperation and competition into adjusted and uh, sustainable order, which is, uh, which is well said. And also you said China active participation in international structure is now crucial to the development of the rest of the world. Its contribution will be key to making progress to the greatest challenges we face, which will continue to be transnational in nature. Uh, U.S.-China co-evolution in a globalized international system is the only realistic and productive path forward. So I think you said very well. Uh, now I, it seems now the, uh, the 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 you know we have a a, a lot of a slowdown on the global level, like WTO, like uh, you know uh, uh, other other international system. But then we have the regional, uh, uh, you know, uh, actually getting together now and then RCEP. Uh, you know, China forged with. Uh, uh, ASEAN, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and then CPTPP, of course, uh, led by Japan uh, and uh, uh, Australia, but used to be designed by the US. Uh, so, so Susan, do you think that uh, on this global governance system, you know, how can we really uh, push forward? I mean, uh, like in a, in a more, uh, 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 let's say globalization point two or, or globalization point three, that uh, whereas US, probably China also, that we can really, uh, work out uh, together with EU, with uh, with other uh, uh, major economy, and uh, maybe maybe G10 should have a uh, you know have a, including China, Russia, India have a climate summit uh, or, 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 or pandemic summit, and G20 should play more role and uh, and how the UN you know uh, can be more uh, 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 enhanced as well. And China is already the second largest donor to the UN, and then largest in the peacekeeping. Uh, a force of the security members. So what, what do you think about that and uh, how we can improve the global governance? I mean, in light of this new adjustment we, we're probably facing uh, right now. We've had in this forum that um, was started on the back of the Global Solutions Summit around the G20. It's not a perfect title, but it's called the China West Dialogue. And it's really more about um, how to make sure that China is included in all of these global conversations. Because what I see and what I worry about is China kind of also sort of leaning out of the international system and starting a parallel track on its own where it's trying to sort of, it's frustrated in the international system, it's not able to get its voice heard, it's not participating as robustly as other countries and probably the Europeans are the most robust participators in the international system because they're the real rule drivers, I think, in the system more than the U.S. or China, actually. But but the, but we need China to be in the conversation and be participating actively and driving in this sort of consensus building way. And um, I think there's been a feeling, at least among people that that uh, participate in those uh, meetings, that that they don't have enough Chinese participation always, um, that China is a bit reticent still on the global stage to step up and contribute. Um, I've seen a big change over the last 20 years, certainly in this, in this space, but I think more is needed. I think the G20 is a very important uh, platform 
Um, you know, it was created after, well, it was, it's been around for a while, but it really got going after the uh, financial crisis of 2008, 2009. And it's a big organization, you know, 20 countries is a lot, but it is a good flexible format where you can get, you know, different combinations of these countries. You can have guests, but it's not as huge as the UN with 190 something countries. Um, which becomes a little bit unwieldy. So I think one question is sort of how to make these institutions that we have more action oriented and more specific and more productive. I mean, some of the um, annual meetings and fora that we have are more for sort of galvanizing conversation and generating consensus, but they move slowly. But we need uh, an organization that can move a little bit more quickly. And I think the G20 um, can be that if it has a little bit more structure and a little bit more uh, directionality and a little bit more support. It hasn't gotten a lot of support, I don't think, from all the countries involved all the time. And I hope it can become a more kind of leading organization. Of course, we've got the OECD on the economic front. We've got the World Bank and the IMF will continue to be important. So there are just a lot of uh, organizations at this point, and I think trying to get them to cohere, you really need the leadership driving it that comes from like a leaders meeting at the G20, something like that. Um, you know, I'm all for regional trade agreements, but frankly, you know, the global trading system is a global system and the WTO has to serve and, you know, Every country is in there that is a member of this global trading system and, um, you know, generating consensus there and reforms is difficult, but it, you know, that has system has got to work and China's got to help us get that system to work, frankly. Um, and, you know, a big part of this is going to be how can we fit, you know, China's unique sort of economic model together with the economic models of others and what kind of changes can be made on both sides to make it fair and make uh, countries feel like they are able to compete and participate, you know, uh, on a level playing field in that, in that arena. And I think we have a lot of work to do there.